Good evening. My name is Małgorzata Bakalaj de Verge, and I'm Director of Academic Programs at the Center for Jewish History. I am thrilled to welcome you tonight to the opening program of our spring semester with another conversation in our series Family Affairs. The Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions, American Jewish Historical Society, American Sephardi Federation, Liebeck Institute, YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, and Yeshiva University Museum. Together, these collections create the second largest archive of the Jewish experience in the world. Above all, though, the collections housed at the center invite explorations of Jewish histories and stories in their multiple dimensions, as they inspire encounters, exchanges of ideas, and conversations like the one we are about to enjoy. Tonight, we continue our Family Affairs series with a conversation about the author's grandparents and parents' turbulent life trajectories before, during, and after World War II in New York, Europe, British Palestine, and Australia. The Family Affairs series features scholars who, at different moments of their careers, decided to turn to their personal history and the micro and macro findings and questions these stories inspire. The series is curated by Dr. Natalia Alexion, who will share more thoughts about it in her introduction and who has been moderating all the conversations these, uh, this academic year. Before I pass her the virtual mic, let me introduce her and the panelists. Natalia Alexion is professor of modern Jewish history at the Graduate School of Jewish Studies, Turo College, New York. Her research interests developed around the Holocaust, Polish and Jewish history and historiography, gender studies and beyond. She published Where To? The Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944-1950, and co-edited two volumes of Berlin Journal examining Holocaust memory and Jewish historiography. She has recently published a critical edition of The Destruction of Żółkiew Jews by Gershon Tafet. Her book, Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust, which we celebrated here at the center in September, is about to be released by Littmann Library of Jewish Civilization. She is preparing a volume of Pauline devoted to Jewish childhoods, children, and child rearing in Eastern Europe. She's currently a Gerda Henkel Fellow at Imre Kertes Kolek in Jena, Germany, completing a book on Jewish medical students in East Central Europe. Sharon Ann Musher is Associate Professor of History at Stockton University. She writes and teaches about the New Deal, social and cultural history, motherhood, Jewish women, anti-Semitism, and slave narratives. Her first book, Democratic Art, The New Deal's Influence on American Culture, traces a range of aesthetic visions that flourished during 1930s to outline the successes, shortcomings, and lessons of the golden age of government funding for the arts. Her current book project, Promised Lands, Hadassah Kaplan, Zionism and the Making of American Jewish Women, uses her grandmother's archive to explore the coming of age of American Jewish women in the early 20th century in a story that foreshadows an emerging special relationship between American Jews and Palestine, Israel. David Slutsky is Lotis Morgan, Associate Professor in Contemporary Jewish Life and Culture in Monash University uh, in Melbourne, Australia. From 2013 to 19, he was an assistant professor of Jewish studies at the College of uh, Charleston. He is the author of Sing at My Funeral, Sing This at My Funeral, a memoir of fathers and sons, and the International Jewish Labor Bund after 1945, toward a global history. And he's co-editor of Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust, and In the Shadows of Memory, The Holocaust and the Third Generation. Finally, two reminders. You're welcome to write down your questions for the Q&A portion of our program. To do so, please use the Q&A function visible on the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions throughout the program. Also, our program is recorded and will be available via the center's website and YouTube channel soon. So we will email you the link to the recording once it is ready. And now, without further ado, family affairs. My grandfather's story, like really, and really filtered down through to me in ways that I hadn't really understood before I started thinking about it more in depth, things I took for granted. And all of a sudden I, I kind of like 
my dad's death put things into focus in a way they hadn't before. So it's really like where the book was born. And, you know, it was like a, it, in some ways it was a labor of love. Like <laughs> professionally, it was like, um, it was a bit risky <laughs> to, to write a memoir as a, as a professional historian. Um, but also I, I set aside everything because it was seemed at the time, like the most important thing I could do. And this was part of like, the grief thing is like the things I was writing at the time just didn't seem that important anymore or like nothing seemed that important. So telling this story seemed quite urgent. Um, so yeah, that, that's where my, my book was born. Thank you, Sharon. Terrific. Um, I also want to thank Natalia and Malgo and David for this really uh, a wonderful opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, I want to talk about the biography of this book as Natalia has asked for, um, but I know that down the road she's going to ask more about inheriting an archive and inheriting material and how that helps to shape it. So I'm going to put on hold a little bit of the biography question and start off by talking about the book project itself. Unlike David's wonderful book, which I've read, which I encourage others to read too, mine is still in process. Um, and, uh, and so there's no chance that people would have read it already. So um, Promised Lands describes a year, uh, really, uh, from 1932 to 1933, when my grandmother, Hadassah Kaplan, went to British Mandate Palestine. Um, at the time, she was a recently laid off Jewish 19-year-old substitute teacher in New York. And in the middle of August, shortly before the school year was to begin, she receives a letter from the supervisor in the public school where she had been teaching. And that letter told her that the job that she thought she had, that she'd been working at, was no longer available. And this was really kind of a typical experience for young female teachers at the time. But Hadassah herself came from a privileged and unusual background. Uh, she was living with her parents, so she didn't have to worry about where her next meal would come from. And her parents were pretty unusual. She was the daughter of Mordechai Kaplan, the founder of Reconstructionism. Um, and as such, she came from an unusual Jewish and Zionist family. As the story goes, and it's told in multiple sources, and again, I'm happy to talk about those different kinds of sources that I've been looking at. Hadassah and her parents had epiphanies separately, but on the same Sabbath afternoon, that what she should do is go to Palestine. Uh, over the next 10 days, she bought a one-way ticket. She found chaperones and a friend to travel with, packed her bags, and she boarded the Exacorda bound for Jaffa. And she would spend the next nine months living in Jerusalem, studying Hebrew and traveling through Mandate Palestine, and then two months returning through the Middle East and Europe. And my book tells the story of her journey as a window into the role that Zionism and a Jewish homeland played in the imagination of American Jewish women in the early 20th century. Uh, such women not only played key roles in developing a Jewish homeland, but also envisioned that land as reviving Jewish life far beyond its borders. Uh, furthermore, Zionism, particularly for those with the capacity to travel, offered young Jewish adventurous women a socially acceptable way to challenge cultural conventions while still maintaining their Jewish and family bonds. And today, as many people wrestle with the complicated realities of Jewish nationhood and continuity, Recovering Hadassah's story and that of her peers provides insight into an earlier generation's dreams and also lacuna regarding a Jewish homeland and peoplehood. And I, I guess in terms of a biography of the book, the story, we'll talk more about that as we move forward, but the, this, the story is personal. She's my grandma, I love her. I was very, very close to her, um, but the, um, and I knew about this trip and I knew about this year, um, but it's not a long 
trauma story that kind of informed my life and upbringing in the same kind. Uh, I mean, David's story, which is so rich and um, and so personal. Um, that, you know, even when I look at the back of the book, David's story is listed as a memoir. My story is is not a memoir. Um, I I begin the opening. Uh, I describe um, uh, sitting. Shiva at my grandma's and I go to her she's beautiful she had this beautiful old wooden desk and I went to the desk and I pulled it open and I found she had a mail order catalog and sandwiched in the middle of the mail order cat uh, catalog you know between the sweatshirts and the bras or something like that was a letter that her father Mordecai Kaplan had written uh, in 1920. Uh, five at the founding of Hebrew University uh, to his wife, Lena, describing what had happened. And, you know, my grandma suffered from dementia at the end of her life. And so all the papers were kind of mixed up, but I find this letter and it's amazing. And I think what other letters are there there? And, you know, what, what stories are yet to be told? And this was a story that I, um, that I held on to and, and wanted to un unpack. This is amazing. And we will go back to those uh, recovered letters in, in both of your projects. But, but you picked on something that I think is extremely f fascinating, but also very much on the surface, how much your uh, book, Sharon, is a story of emancipation and adventure and self-exploration. Uh, and and David's is uh, you put it David you put it yourself that this is a conversation with ghosts that this is a, a intercourse with ghosts that the, there is a specter of family in the book so in in a way these are two um, incredibly different uh, uh, projects about people that could belong to the same uh, generation right that that had in the sort of broader historical context um, that that they shared but I want to go back to beloved grandmother in 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 your case someone you knew personally and in David's uh, case uh, Jakub uh, 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 is is a grandfather that you only know as a presence but but also an absence uh, and if you could talk a little bit more about again um, a historian, uh, a historian's relationship with the material that comes from that distance, but at the same time that closeness of of a grand grandparent, grandmother, uh, grandfather figure. Sharon, do you want to go first this time? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it. I guess one of the tricky things as a his, historian, you know, you, you sort of train to like have this critical distance and, you know, like I think often we sympathize and empathize and, and root for the people we write about. I mean, certainly we, I don't think we ever think they're perfect people, but, uh, and certainly people who write about like the Nazis don't sympathize with them necessarily, but hopefully but um so that was a joke everyone but <laughs> you know like I, I think there's an extent to which we identify often with with the figures we write about particularly when we're writing like micro histories and and histories of families or towns um so in that sense it's like perfectly normal I think to identify with these figures but um you know that and, and we don't want to like think we ever want to like humiliate the people we write about so you know this sort of sense of like trying to capture that story and like do the responsible thing as a historian of having critical distance I, I think objectivity is the wrong word because I don't think we're ever objective um, you know that's like a, a, a bit of a tight rope that I think when we're writing about our own pasts we have to walk um, and also being willing to, you know, like talk about things that the person in question might not have wanted us to talk about. Like, I don't know that it was, it, you know, I tell this story in the book of how my grandfather escaped uh, Poland. Wotswavek was the city that he lived in in the interwar period. And he describes it in these letters. It's a story that I basically knew the contours of, but, uh, and I'll talk about the letters in a little bit, but, 
you know, he describes it in quite quite an, an amount of detail that surprised me. And basically, like, he had a wife and two sons. Uh, they were, um, you know, like preteen, preteens, the sons. And they decided that he was a Bundist and he should escape because as a socialist, he was in mortal danger. But um, they thought the Nazis would have some kind of, you know, Rahmanes, like pity on women and children. And so he fled in November, the end of November 1939. And in the end, he survived in the Soviet Union, but his wife and sons were murdered. Like, that's a bit of a sensitive story I discovered when I wrote the first draft and showed it to some people, like that story of my grandfather, because it on the surface, it kind of sounds like he abandoned his family, which is totally not the case. Um, with the best information and evidence they had, they made the best decision and the safest decision that they could. Um, but like in retrospect, telling that story required a lot of sensitivity. So it, cause it, it really isn't a story of like, you know, a husband abandoning his family to be murdered. Um, they actually thought he was the one in danger in the, even in the Soviet Union. Um, or stories about my dad that, you know, we had a, a, an amazing relationship, but I tell a story of a fight we had. And I, I know he would have hated that being in print. You know, that was not a story he would like to have been told publicly. Um, but I thought it was important also, like, you know, to, to sort of show that the people I write about, even though I admire them a great deal, were human. Um, and to sort of show that and, and show their humanity in that way, rather than showing them to be these perfect beacons, to show them to be imperfect was like an important part of sort of bridging that divide between historian and memoirist. It's it's fascinating in a way, Sharon, and, and I will give you the mic in a second. Uh, just following up on, on David, what you were saying um, with great courage, um, despite their dog, uh, barking uh, that um, it seems to me that you, you on the one hand you call people in your book cast of characters right and at the same time they have this other identity of 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 people that are intimately your your circle but but when you talk about uh, the kind of measuring up and understanding and contextualization and and not taking history a particular uh, incident on its face value of how it would seem, but understanding how one really could understand it better. I mean, this is really a historian speaking, right? So, so it's fascinating that even in this short, uh, um, uh, short episode that you're sharing with us now, there is a grandson and a son and a historian of Jewish history speaking sort of in one in one voice. And and Sharon, how did it how does it work for you as you are working through this book? I, I think it's very similar. I, I mean, like David, I, I approach this material starting off as a historian. I I I inherited an archive. My parents, I'm very grateful, went through and organized um, materials. And when I got it, it looked like an archive. It looked like a series of letters and photographs and diaries and, and the like. And, um, and I have tried to read them with a historian's eye, trying to triangulate my sources to figure out what's happening, who these different characters are. Now, the fact that I knew my grandma, that I knew the different characters, some of her friends, I, I knew the, um, the, the person who she travels with to Palestine. I went to Hebrew school with her grandson. So, you know, th these are people whose, you know, our, our lives have been intertwined. Um, you know, uh, David's comment about um, wanting to portray people, especially people that you love in a positive light and, uh, you know, knowing how would they feel if they read this? Would they, you know, would they be critical? And, and for me, there's another layer to this, which is that I'm blessed to have a large extended family. And there are other people who will read this story. There are other people who are probably on this talk who may have thoughts about the various things that I say. Um, and so the, the extended family uh, bit of it uh, plays into the stories that we say. I mean, I will say that as a, as a historian, I'm trying not to 
um, censor myself. So there are stories that people might not want to hear. I mean, there's um, an affair with a 44 year old married man with two children who's Scottish and not Jewish on the ship on the ride over, which she of course doesn't write home about to mama and papa and her sisters, but does make it into the diary that she uh, that she writes. Um, and there's, you know, a very entertaining story of her chaperones who were her, um, uh, the heads of the camp that she grew up at, Camp Moden, who come kind of knocking on her door, door right after this man has left uh, her room. So there, you know, there are stories that um, might not seem all that appropriate uh, to tell. Now that I think the fact that I have the distance of being a grandchild as opposed to a child certainly makes it easier to tell those stories. Um, there's a piece of me that thinks uh, as, as scandalized as grandma might be that that story, and I just told that story, um, she might think it's a little bit funny actually. Um, she was quite a character in her own right. And part of this story is about, you know, there were places where young adventurous women, um, Jewish women could go uh, on their path uh, that would, um, help them find their way, both in terms of experimenting with identity and other things, and also in terms of embracing Judaism um, and finding a, a meaningful uh, spiritual life. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I hope I didn't say I that. want to, I want to, yeah, just go add, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. can I just add one other thing about like the, the way that being a historian shapes and challenges the, the process of writing these things is the gaps and the silences in the story. So like we have these materials that we collect and gather and, you know, for, for Sharon and I, it was like letters, family letters were an important part of it. Um, but there's also like so many holes in these stories, like I'm telling stories that go back 120 years and the protagonists are mostly no longer alive. And so you kind of speak to people to, you do archival research to help fill gaps. You do genealogical research. You speak to people in the family who then tell you, and Sharon, I'm, I'm guessing you have the same thing, tell you opposite versions of the same story. And you have to kind of like make sense of those. And I think that's where being a historian um, really helps tell these kinds of stories is like you can take warring versions of the stories and kind of, you know, one of the ways I dealt with it was I actually meditated on those gaps in the text and talked about how, you know, we don't actually know the truth of this, but here's the, here are the versions of the story that got passed down. And then why did they get passed down? Like, what's the investment in, like, one of the stories my great-grandfather before World War I travelled to Berlin. Um, he was a, he had a shoemaking workshop, but... He was also a Chazan. So the question is, did he go to Berlin to perform at the at Rosh Hashanah and Kol Nidre at the big synagogue in Berlin? Or did he go to um, like a conservatorium? Like there's <laughs> quite different versions of that story. And he got arrested and imprisoned by the German military on the way back because it was the middle of World War. Like there's all these, you know, weird versions of the stories that get passed down that we have to actually figure out how to deal with with that and I think being historians kind of helps navigate that too. This is fantastic and it takes it takes me actually to something that Sharon uh, already alluded to to that uh, uh, letter found uh, from from 1925, but but if I, I know that the heart of your search for physical material is is the inheritance, are the objects that you might have not had in your possessions if this was not your family, your family history. And um, in David's book, there is an opening, a beautiful story of a search for. Uh, for uh, family letters, uh, and there is a, there is a wonderful letter collection uh, for Sharon. So, if you could talk about letters in particular, but also other kinds of heirlooms that one might have to to write family history. 
Sharon, do, do you want to start with your letter? Sure, sure. I'm happy to start with that. I mean, that's really the story of my biography of developing this project. And I loved reading David's story of finding the, that, that archive of letters too, because it really resonated uh, with my own account. So I, I was very close to my grandma and I really admired her and I really admired, she had these three incredible sisters. Uh, they included a, a musicologist, a theater and film producer and a psychiatrist and sculptor. And I, I kind of had this, um, vision that I wanted to write about them a long time ago, like even going into graduate school, but I thought that no one would take this project seriously or take me seriously, especially as a, as a woman. I, I, I felt, you know, and I wrote on New Deal art and um, I did, uh, you know, very clearly academic work and actually I'm not a Jewish historian, I'm a modern US historian. Um, but when I finished that book, I, I found myself, um, you know, the mother of three daughters uh, with a very full-time teaching job with my hands really, really full. And so I, when my grandmother passed away in 2013 and I, you know, found that letter at the Shiva and then I had known that my grandma had kept diaries um, when she was in Palestine. I knew about that year. I knew about it because um, before I went off to graduate school, I had interviewed her. Um, and I had interviewed her especially about that, uh, that year. Um, and I had notes. They were handwritten notes in you know, a journal uh, from the summer in Westport, Connecticut, sitting, um, you know, just sitting and talking with her. And um, I, I knew that the diaries existed, but I thought that they were going to be really cryptic. I had this uh, vision uh, that um, uh, I had this vision that she would just have names and dates on it and I would have to recreate a whole world out of that. Um, and uh, what I found though was that it was this incredible archive. Uh, she was the last in her uh, immediate family to pass away. And so everybody I imagine had sent the letters to her. So she had all the letters that she had written to her three sisters and her parents and all the letters that they wrote back to her, the correspondence with her father, Mordechai Kaplan was in Hebrew with every Everybody else it was in English. I also had her diaries. Um, they're in Hebrew and in English. And I had her letters. And the letters, as she did her whole life, are meticulously labeled in the back. They tell you when they were taken and where it was and who the person is. I, I can still hear, hear her, you know, sitting on my shoulder telling me, label your picture. You know, now we have everything digital and everything is unlabeled and a mess and the like, but, you know, label your picture. So, um, this was an enormous gift to me, um, the, this archive. Um, it was a, a personal gift because I look at the letters and I remember getting letters at camp. I remember getting letters throughout my life, you know, from my grandma. It's, it's tiny little sloping handwriting. And so it's a, it's a personal gift, um, but it was also a professional gift um, at, at a time that it was hard for me to travel, that it was hard for me to figure out, you know, which project should come Next, I, I really wanted a um, case study, small, intimate, personal project that would be meaningful, that even if it took me a long time to get through, I would get through because I would want to come back to it. So I, I, I do consider that an enormous gift uh, that my grandma left me and that my parents facilitated in getting it into my hands. Uh, this is fascinating. and and the. I, I think also um, thinking now about a conversation we had a few months ago with um, Daniel Mendelssohn um, uh, when we started this series um, and in David's case, case as well, and David, you'll, you'll speak about it, I'm sure, that you have this kind of uh, idyllic, perfect universe in which the uh, family archive is complete, in which the pictures are labeled, in which there is correspondence uh, going both ways, uh, which in some ways, I guess, relates to the time and place in which your family history unfolds as opposed to um, uh, destruction, uh, multiple um, migrations. Uh, but uh, but but it's 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 fascinating that in some ways the process is a sim the, and the emotional and intellectual relationship is similar. 
David, do you want to? Oh, Sharon, I'll just say one thing and then I'll give it to David. There are still gaps. It, it, it may look like it's a complete archive, but there are many voices that are missing from this story. And I do try to access those voices and, and find them along the way. But let me hand it. So my first book was about Bundists after World War II. Um, you know, they say all history is autobiographical. So I took that quite seriously. <laughs> Um, but my first book was about Bundes after World War II. And I think I learned pretty quickly in my training as a historian that like part of the role of a historian is just to like put together scraps of anything you can find and not expect that you're going to get anything that looks like a complete archive and that you have to extrapolate from those kinds of sources. So, you know, my mentality has always been like, what can I find and what can I learn from, from that? That said, like, I found this um, cache of letters in Los Angeles in, in a cousin's garage. And without the letters, this book would not have been, it certainly would not have been the same, might not have been a book. <laughs> you know, the, those letters, there's about 40 of them. They span the years 1946 in Wrocław, our Natalia, our mutual um, spiritual homeland or, or real homeland or whatever, <laughs> um, through to 1978, right before my grandfather died uh, in Melbourne. And there's a bunch of letters from Paris where they did a, a, a couple of years in transit. And, you know, these letters, I, I mean, I thought a, a shelf was going to collapse on me when I was searching for the letters <laughs> because they were really buried deep in a, in a garage. Um, but the letters were just an incredible revelation. I, I had vaguely known that they existed and, you know, like getting to Los Angeles wasn't always easy. So when I had the opportunity, I, I jumped on it. And, you know, I remember that reading the first letter that I found, like the first thing I did, that there was a box and it just had a whole lot of stuff in it that my great uncle had collected. So like there were all the letters from my grandfather, but then there were also postcards and letters from their their one of their sister well their their surviving sister and brother-in-law and birthday cards and greeting cards and just a whole lot of stuff that my great uncle had kept so I separated out the letters put them in um, chronological order and I read the first one I was sitting in a deli in Beverly Hills um, and it was just they're in Yiddish the handwriting is very neat um, and legible, although small. And the letters were in amazingly good condition, given that they'd been folded up and tucked away in a, you know, in a garage for I don't know how many decades. And, you know, for the first time, my grandfather had a voice. And I think that was really um, the, the major revelation. Like I could imagine how he spoke how he thought, how he felt. I had this window, I would say into, I'm not very spiritual, but I would say I had a window into his soul in a way. Like he was so um, forthright and open in these letters. And, you know, he spoke with, he wrote, I should say, with such a distinctive voice in such a, in such a literary way, like in this way that like if you were, raised in this kind of Polish Jewish environment in the first half of the 20th century. And you're like this aspired to this worker intellectual, you know, he wrote in that way where he was very well read and he always had like either a Yiddish, a Polish or a Russian um, uh, catchphrase to like illustrate some point he was making. Um, and, you know, like even just holding the letters, was an incredible revelation. Holding these letters that my grandfather, who I didn't know, but who loomed large, had written, had sat at a desk at one o'clock in the morning in Wrocław, writing to his brother, who he had just discovered was alive. You know, the, the materiality of these artifacts, knowing, and more than photos, I think, like photos were also an incredible find. I include a lot of photos in there, but Photos also get reproduced in different ways. And I don't know, there's something about like that piece of paper and knowing the pen that my grandfather held and wrote with. You know, I found a letter once in an archive that Einstein had written. It was, an, it was to the 
some association of Holocaust survivors that it was an apology he couldn't come to their ball. I was like, oh my God, Einstein <laughs> wrote this with his hand and I'm holding it. Was it, you know, the, neat, that... was it the neat handwriting? Uh, Einstein's no, <laughs> not neat. <laughs> but my grandfather, you know, like it, it gave me this almost concrete connection mm -hmm. uh, that, that I'd never really felt before. Also, there was something a bit... Um, you know, like I was learning things that I think no one else in my family knew. And there was something a little bit, um, maybe subversive is not quite the right word, but, but like that, you know, I was like being let in on a secret. Um, and, and there was something kind of thrilling about that too. Um, so yeah, the, the letters, um, they, for me, they were the main kind of artifact. Like, and I think that's part of, you know, being a, like writing from that descendant of, of survivors perspective is you don't have a lot of artifacts um, because they got left behind. Like, so we've got some photos that were recovered that my grandfather kept with him. We have these letters that his wife and sons wrote to him from the ghetto in Wotswavek while he was in the Soviet Union. But, you know, and they're, they're in Polish, um, but, you know, heirlooms like we just don't have those kind of things that have survived. Um, and I don't think they were prized that much in our family uh, to mm -hmm. the same extent. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the letters just, the letters were a huge revelation for me. It's, it's amazing, again, the, the, the interesting parallel in, in conversation between the two. And Sharon, you mentioned hearing your your grandmother's voice. And then David, you're talking about finding the voice. I'm just curious, your grandfather, there was no recording of his voice. Not only did you not meet him in person. Yeah, not as far as I know. Mm. There's apparently a, when my grandfather and my dad visited Los Angeles in 1959, and my grandfather reconnected with his brother for the first time in nearly three decades. There's apparently some footage of that on a reel somewhere, but no one, no one seems to know. Another exactly. garage, maybe one day. Yeah, and also we need the like player to play it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, maybe. So I, I want to go back because I'm looking nervously at the time and I want to have a chance also to ask some of some questions that were posed. Uh, I want to go back to that historical uh, micro scale or small scale that Sharon, you mentioned that you wanted. Um, and you're a historian of American history, David is a historian of, of Jewish history, European history. And so I wanted to ask you how those stories are changing, uh, shaping, uh, coloring your, uh, your understanding of, of Jewish, modern Jewish experience between New York and, and mandatory Palestine, Poland, uh, post-war, um, pre-war, France, Australia. How, how did it change your picture by this particular uh, lens? Sharon, if you can. Sure, I'm happy to take it first. So I think I wanna talk about three different ways in which it's changed my thinking. Uh, one relates to the thinking about my great grandfather, Mord Mordecai Kaplan, and particularly his emerging ideas about Zionism. Uh, this project has given me an opportunity to learn more about what his ideas were, how they changed over time, and what role Hadassah's vision might have played in, uh, in his ideas. This is a time when um, most people were non-Zionist, anti-Zionist, and the like, and, and his ideas, um, particularly about cultural Zionism and the role that he didn't believe that everybody should move to Palestine, uh, but his ideas about uh, what Zionism as an idea and the idea of a Jewish homeland could do in terms of a Jewish cultural renaissance uh, were, really, were really significant. And I think that Hadassah's experience helps to uh, shape that. Um, the second way that I think about this is uh, that it provides a window into 
family history and particularly the relationships between parents and children and among siblings in the early 20th century. Um, and it's quite a profound window that I have into those relationships, uh, particularly I, I, they're really poignant relationships both between mother and daughter and father and, uh, and daughter um, uh, in terms of how they try to facilitate uh, their own daughter reaching her kind of self-fulfillment. And I think there's something uh, very powerful. It's one thing to read, you know, in the case of my great grandfather, you might read um, uh, Jewish thinkers ideas about self-actualization written in super philosophical and sociological language, but to see him write to his daughter, you are the one to decide your future. You know, when she writes to him and says, well, I don't know, should I stay? Should I go? What, what am I supposed to do? I mean, he really uses this language of self-actualization. He says, um, uh, you should figure out which place will give you personal development and self-realization. So I think for me, uh, it, it, um, this project is family and personal, but it also gives a window into Mordechai Kaplan into his development and ideology into family relations in the early 20th century. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, there's a real story about the opportunities that were available to a small cohort of American Jewish women um, at the time. Uh, they were increasingly uh, traveling, uh, seeing Zionism either through the ability to go there or through Hadassah and um, activism around it as creating a space uh, for them um, to pursue ends that they weren't able to pursue through academics, uh, through uh, professions, um, and especially at a time in the depression when it was hard to find a marriage partner. I mean, people were not getting married. They were living with their parents. They were, um, you know, uh, didn't have the same kinds of opportunities, but even beyond the depression in the early 20th century, there was a cohort of these American Jewish women who were traveling. Um, and I think that my grandma's story provides a window into what they did uh, and, and how they did it and what the consequences were. Which is, which is fascinating. I'm thinking, David, about your, uh, your, grandma, your, your grandmother Gittel, your, your grandfather's first, I mean, not your grandmother in a sense of his first wife, right? And and the cohort of women that you touch on writing in this in this book, they're not traveling, uh, or at least not traveling like that, but but there is a path to emancipation. I, but but please take this question where where you want to take it. I, I mean I, I was gonna say that in a way I think the um to me it's almost the reverse of what you asked originally. It's not so much how does the story shaped my understanding of Jewish history, but because I always lived with this story. And so to me, it's more like how, how has being a Jewish historian shaped my understanding of this story? Um, and in a way, you know, it's been really important. Like it's given a lot of context. And I think being a historian of like Polish Jews, particularly in migration, has given me access to like understand why the decisions they made, why they made certain decisions why they were as they were, you know, like to understand the lives of Polish Jews in the interwar period has been really important to make sense of like the kinds of um, institutions, the kind of Jewishness that they built in Melbourne after World War II. You know, that those decades after World War II in Melbourne don't make sense without understanding interwar Polish Jewry. So in, in that sense, like, being a Jewish historian has has given life to, to that story that I've always lived with in a way. Um, but I think there are ways also that the story itself, and this is part of what I, I try to do with a book, um, is to show that there are stories out there that are actually really significant in the global history of Jews that haven't been told that much. So, for example, you know, the story of my uh, grand, well, in this case, my grandfather, but all four of my grandparents survived World War II in the Soviet Union. And that's really like a, a young field in the historiography of the Holocaust. I note, um, Atina, you're out there somewhere and, and you've been writing about this too. Um, you know, this uh, and really important stuff. 
this is an area that hasn't been touched on enough. The story of like surviving in a deportee camp or a gulag in Siberia, um, you know, it, it, it is certainly better than Auschwitz and Buchenwald, but it's not a cakewalk either. It's not an easy, it's not an easy, wasn't an easy life. So I think, and you know, a quarter of a million or 300,000 Polish Jews survived the war in the Soviet Union, like way more than actually survived under Nazi occupation. And so this is an important story, I think, that also needs to be told. So, you know, I tried to sort of make sure the stories of my family were speaking to bigger things that were happening in the Jewish world, like the story of Melbourne, Jews in Melbourne, Australia, which I think is actually a pretty significant one. You know, part of my mission now living in Melbourne and being a historian of Australian Jews is to show like Melbourne is a global centre of Jewish life and culture. Um, you know, these are stories that I think are really important. Um, so yet partly I'm trying to make this broader contribution to how we understand 20th century Jewish history. I must say, apropos Melbourne, that you made me Google all kinds of neighborhoods uh, with, <laughs> with names, you know, that meant very little aside from how you uh, how you describe them in a, in a book. So you certainly made that space into, into a subject of, of inquiry and, and questioning. I, uh, there are some wonderful questions uh, uh, that were typed. So I will just end mine with, uh, again, somewhat open-ended question of uh, between the things that you already touched, both of you, uh, self-censorship, gaps, voids, and questions that are unanswered that I'm sure whatever project historians take on, um, we, we are left with questions that we still have unanswered. But how, how does it play out in, in family history? And then we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, I'll take it first. Is that okay? Go, go ahead. Because I really did want to pick up on this question of gaps. I know it sounds like I have this complete archive because I because I do. I have the exchange back and forth, but there are so many voices that are missing from this story. Um, I think about in Ari Shafit's My Promised Land, he he describes um, uh, going on the imagining going on the ship to Palestine with, I can't remember if it's his grandfather or his great grandfather, um, but he uh, imagines seeing all the things that in the record that he has of his grandfather, great grandfather, um, he doesn't write about, you know, what, what is the story? What does he see of Arabs, Arab Palestinians? What is, what is that story? And that's a story that I've been trying to read behind the, between the lines uh, in my grandmother's record. Um, and it's not always the story that I want it to be. Um, there are things that I would like her to say or do or think uh, that she doesn't. Um, and I, I don't want to whitewash that story as I tell it. She, she comes with stereotypes about Arabs. Um, she sees them in particular kinds of ways. And I think it's really important. Uh, I mean, part of my process of reading this story and understanding it has been to try and understand what did she know about Palestine before and what did she think about Palestine? What are the different voices she hears? I mean, she is, hears so many warnings. I mean, I talked about that mother-daughter relationship. I mean, I, as I said before, I'm a mother of three daughters. I understand what it is to be anxious and be overprotective and all of that, but her mother is warning her, don't go anywhere, watch out for the Arabs. I mean, this is part of the language. She also says, watch out for the Jewish Palestinian. You know, she wants them to watch, she wants her to watch out for everybody, but don't go anywhere by yourself. I mean, she has heard this language and of course it's only a few years after the Arab rebellion. So they're, they're you know, she's, she is cognizant um, of what's happened, but there's, there's a much more nuanced story in, and I'm privileged to have access to, you know, my great grandfather's uh, diaries. He has a much more nuanced response to the Arab rebellion and what's going on and de demands for Arab nationalism. And I am looking for that. Where is that? I mean, there, you know, there are moments that I want to engage. I wish I could have a conversation. Um, I, I think Natalie Zeman Davis wrote this great book where uh, she opens with, uh, she imagines herself having a conversation. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title of the book. She imagines herself having a conversation with these three different women and, and the questions she would ask them. And I, I, 
I wish that I could ask questions and I, you know, there are some that I can't. So, you know, I, I'm inspired by David's approach of, of adding that process into the manuscript so that people at least see that I, as historian and scholar and writer and granddaughter, am grappling with those ideas. I think I would say my starting point was a gap. And that's really like the, uh, that it's maybe like a slightly different way into an answer to this question than, than maybe what you intended, Natalia, but the, the whole thing is born of absence and gaps, you know, not knowing my grandfather, losing my father, um, and what it means to, like, live in a world not knowing those, those people, those things, what it means to be, you know, also to, to pick up on what Sharon's saying about parenting, like being a father without a father, um, or being a father who, you know, like in my dad's case, being a father who really didn't have a good model for fatherhood. Um, what do you do in the absence of what you, of the kind of normality <laughs> that you seek? Um, and so, you know, my, I, I talk a lot about ghosts in the book, you know, the, the, the book, I say the book is about ghosts. It's about the ghosts of my grandfather. It's about uh, and my father, but it's also about like all this additional cast of ghosts, their families, um, the families we didn't meet, the families we know so little about. Um, and so what impact does that have? Like what is the, the, like the gaps in our family in a way is what I'm trying uh, and what impact that has. Like my dad was named Schmulek after his father's, well, they, they said it was after his grandfather who was killed during World War I, but his half-brother who was killed at Helmer was called Schmulek. So what does that mean to, like, have that absence and, but, but be a constant presence? Like, if you're named Schmulek, to know that you're named, you have the same name as your dead half-brother, um, what does that, that mean? And then how does that shape everything that, that comes later? So that's really, like, those gaps... I mean, as well as the gaps as a historian and just so much we don't actually know. Um, and, and yeah, like Sharon said, like you've, in a way you've just got to kind of speculate and put your process out there so people know that you're trying your best to deal with it honestly and we can't know everything. And I think as this is one thing I've learned as a historian is you just got to be comfortable with silence and gaps and knowing that you're not going to know it all. Um, and trying to make sense of what you can know and figure out. It's it's fascinating uh, because uh, when I first thought of our conversation, I somehow assumed, uh, you know, a historian in me that we will uh, discuss uh, Zionism and the Bundism and different visions of Jewish future and how these visions change and how it plays out in family history. But we are ultimately, you're ultimately telling us uh, stories that are so much richer than these, you know, big projects in modern Jewish politics um, uh, of the 20th century. And, and I, I want to pick on something and, and, and use it as a segue to the first question that I saw asked already. Um, um, David, you were talking about gaps and what in your book is very apparent is that in, incredible continuity. Someone actually was asking how you were um, able to uh, learn to read Yiddish? Was it difficult to read your grandfather's Yiddish script uh, in the letters? And, you know, so uh, we, in the previous conversations, we had that sense of, of discontinuity, of really intense rupture in which the language changed, the country changed, uh, the voc everything changed. And, and yet you have this uh, skiff, Bundist, uh, uh, Yiddish continuity in a family. Uh, but if you can talk a little bit about that language um, um, proficiency and, and how this happened. And then there is a specific question for, for Sharon for you. You muted. Sorry, I'm also, I'm with you, Natalia, a year into this and I still do that. Um, I learned Yiddish growing up. Um, I, so I, I had this experience that I thought was perfectly normal until I was an adult and realized it was pretty abnormal. 
that I went to a Yiddish day school. That is, a, a, we have a school in Melbourne still today, and my son is there right now, maybe even in Yiddish class, where we learn to read and speak um, and write Yiddish. Um, so, you know, from about the age of uh, three or four, I was learning for, like formal Yiddish classes, but also I heard it um, constantly. My grandparents spoke to me in Yiddish. And I, of course, and as, you know, children of immigrants do, I answered in English. Um, so, and my parents spoke Yiddish to their parents. Um, although my grandparents spoke Polish to each other and to their siblings. And not because they didn't want people to understand, because that, that was the language they spoke to each other. When they didn't want people to understand, they spoke Russian. So, um you know, I grew up around Yiddish, um, hearing it, reading it, speaking it, learning it. Um, so reading my grandfather's script wasn't, it, it wasn't difficult because he wrote quite neatly. That was a huge relief. Like in other research I've done, like reading handwritten letters can be a real drag. Like it's trying to decipher people's handwriting is, it's a, it's a skill in itself. It's not like writing print so you know once you sort of figure out what are the alephs and what are the dullards and you know you can you can then extrapolate and figure it out quite easily um the the probably the biggest challenge with reading my grandfather was the sprinkling of polish and russian which i don't speak or read so you know i i emailed i, I think maybe once i even emailed you natalia with a question i emailed people i knew to say do you, does this phrase ring a bell because he always had these like amazing um, catchphrases and stuff or things from like Russian literature that he cited. Um, so yeah, that, that continuity, like that was, that's, you're right, Natalia, like there was this insistence on continuing, um, Bundes Yiddish culture in our family, despite all of the ruptures, you know, we've been attached to the Bund for at least a hundred years in our family and, and probably longer. We, do, we don't actually know the origin story there. So, you know, that, that was despite everything, despite everything they experienced, they still maintain this fierce attachment to, to the Bund. And, and that carried to my generation. My son goes to SCIF, which is the Bundes Youth Movement still in Melbourne, um, which, you know, like now I realize is kind of weird in a global Jewish context, but always just seemed perfectly natural growing up. <laughs> you tell this story um, uh, in, a, in the most uh, moving uh, way, but I, I want to go, Sharon, to you with the same question of language, if, uh, if, if you can comment on, uh, on that multilingual aspect of the letters. And then there is a specific question to you. Uh, uh, can Sharon tell us a bit about what her grandmother did while in Palestine? Definitely. So first I'll confess my Hebrew is okay, but really not great. So I did have a wonderful translator who helped me with the Hebrew letters, which were beautifully written. So it wasn't so hard to read them, but I did need um, a whole lot of help uh, on, on that. And I was grateful to have that help. Um, I, in terms of what she did when she was in Palestine. So she was committed to learning Hebrew. That was a big thing for her. And actually she, her Hebrew was excellent. So at the end of her life, I, I think I mentioned before that she suffered from dementia. So there were some three weeks near the end of her life when she, something switched in her brain and she only spoke in Hebrew uh, for three weeks. Uh, she, she wouldn't know my name anymore, but she could still sing songs in Hebrew. So um, uh, that was a very powerful experience that had uh, a, 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 um, a long lasting consequences. So she, she started off, she found Hebrew tutor. She found um, a biblical studies tutor. She tried to go to Hebrew university and enroll in classes, but her Hebrew really wasn't good enough. And she couldn't, she couldn't follow along. So she did that for a little bit and then she left there. Um, she went to lectures. She was really interested in archeology, span especially biblical archeology. span um, She traveled to Petra with a group from Hebrew University. Um, she also, um, uh, uh, um, she went with Judah Magnus's son, David on that trip who 
sort of had a crush on her and she was not as enamored of him. He wanted to, he was very overprotective towards her and she, she didn't like that very much. And then her mother was very upset because she obviously thought that the Magnuses were good catches and David was a good, anyway, I'm, I, I'm going, I'm going on an aside. She travels, she travels a fair amount, uh, sometimes formally like this trip to Petra, sometimes informally. She goes and works on um, a, a couple of different kibbutzim. Uh, she travels from place to place to celebrate the holidays. She spends a fair amount of time, she lives in Jerusalem, but she spends a fair amount of time in Tel Aviv. She often goes there on the weekend. Um, most of her chaperones wind up in Tel Aviv. A uh, few of them are, are in Jerusalem, but so she goes and she visits them on the weekend and she has a whole cohort of friends that she makes uh, who, who are there. Um, I think that gives you the beginning of a sense of what she does over the time. And the book itself tells the story. It, it traces her year and traces her, um, her, her movement and where she goes and what she does. Um, contextualize it. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I will read now a question from Judith Grinberg, and then there is a, another question that was asked actually a while ago. And if you could, we have just a few minutes uh, left, but if you could pick and choose however you want to address this. So uh, the question from Judith uh, is, was it, uh, was it a struggle for you? These are two methodological in a way questions. Was it a struggle for you both to find a unified voice or tone uh, as you combine family history and historical scholarship as someone working on a family history memory project with documents from the Holocaust, I have struggled with reactions to my attempts to navigate my role as an academic trained in comparative literature uh, and as a memoir quote unquote writer. Any suggestions on how to combine the heads you wear in one voice? And then in a way, a connected question from uh, Janet, I think, how do you turn archival letters and snippets of family history filled with holes and silences into a cohesive narrative? How much are you free to add and still maintain authenticity and historical truth? I think you both touched on it, but maybe for dessert, you can come back to some of these questions. So my answer to Judith is a simple yes. <laughs> um, yeah, in a way, it's a, it's a struggle. Um, I, I think actually, like in my case, it's I don't have a unified voice. I have really three, maybe even four overlapping voices. There's the voice of me as participant. There's the voice of me describing uh, as narrator of my father's and grandfather's story. Uh, there's the voice of me as uh, historian sort of interpreting and then in a way there's also particularly in one chapter there's my grandfather's own voice um, where I sort of incorporate the letters um, in a very like ex expanded way um, and you know one one of the bits of feedback I got from from a very trusted colleague about it and I experienced exactly the same pushback as you're talking about um, and maybe even I, maybe I just have a persecution complex, but maybe even worse because I was because I am a Jewish historian and I'm like, you know, this this uh, you might experience this like it's kind of seen as a side project and not, a, you know, a piece of scholarship. And, you know, I kept insisting to people that this is scholarship and this is this is my main project like. You know, this is all like um, how the sausages made stuff, but like a constant discussion I was having while writing it was, well, will this count for tenure in your tenure packet? And I was like, oh my God, this is so, that's such an unimportant question when I'm dealing with the scope of the Jewish 20th century. Um, so yeah, partly it was, it was recognizing when I was doing those things differently and I splice it up. So my narrative isn't, it's also not a coherent unified chronological narrative you know it's it's got commentary spliced into it it jumps around in time it sort of draws on um you know this idea and I, I really remember like in an honors seminar as an undergraduate reading Proust and the way that he would just take a memory and kind of like move with it you know and kind of not follow um in this like straight line of storytelling so so I kind of I'm inspired by that that way of doing it and that gave me some scope I think to 
you know, bring in those different voices and allow them to operate. You know, it took a lot of work. Like one, one colleague told me that, that, that at one, one draft, he said that historical voice isn't working. It's jarring when you sort of just switch to historians mode. So, you know, there was a way I had to sort of like make them a bit more, I guess, cohesive, but also recognize that I was doing sort of three or four different things with, with the different voices. Um, and very quickly, I can't remember the other question now. Oh, turning them into a, co- yeah, I think I dealt with that. <laughs> this was wonderful, Sharon. I'm gonna to try to be brief because I see we're at the very end of our time. So I love this question. I have really struggled with the question of tone also. One way that I've struggled with it is by putting my head in the sand and not sharing my work um, and just trying to find the voice and the voices that I want and not sharing it with other people. That's probably not the greatest strategy. And once more is written, I really do need to share it more because I really do need the benefit of other people's um, feedback. So David and Natalia, I may be sharing with you down the road. Um, but like David, um, there I use several different tones. So as I said before, I open with a more personal one that begins with me and my relationship to my grandmother. The next tone I move into, and I don't know if if it'll work uh, jumping around is much more historical, setting up the context, early 20th century New York. And how is it that she even has the choice, the option to do this kind of thing? What are the structures that, you know, that controlled her opportunities and the like? And from there, I really move into letting the the letters themselves speak. So then we have a number of different perspectives and voices uh, in, in the letters and in the story itself. I feel that I need to go back into that story. This is, of course is evolving. So I feel that as a historian, I have to go back into that story as I'm telling it as it unfolds and give more of the context. I haven't quite figured out how to do that and how those voices go. But sometimes I do honestly think that it's important to trust your instincts and um, you know not let other people tell you where to go. I, I will also say I didn't start this project until I had tenure. Um, so uh, I, I, I understand those voices and I'm on the other end of that so I can do what I want. Um, and so I'm trying to do that. In terms of the archival question, and I see we're at 615, um, one thing, uh, the process, show the process, let people see where the holes are in your material, let them sh- see what you were able to put together and to the best of your abilities, you understand that this is the case, but don't try to use such an authoritative voice um, that, uh, you know, that you're just missing things and don't make things up. So, you know, show, show what you were able to obtain and, and, and what your understanding is. It's wonderful that we live in a time, uh, in, in many ways, a uh, too interesting time, but also in a time in which historians can admit to gaps and not knowing. Um, just thinking about uh, historical books that I was uh, I was raised on um, uh, in Europe, which really were omni-knowing uh, uh, voices. Uh, we, we ran out of time, but this was wonderful and I wish we could continue. If you haven't yet uh, uh, read uh, Sing This at My Funeral, David's um, memoir of father and sons, fathers and sons, uh, please order it. And we cannot wait for Sharon for your book. Uh, and now for the closing to Maugo. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is, it is my pleasure to say the last thank yous. And yes, I am very happy that uh, we cannot continue this conversation right now because it means that we will have to find time to continue it later, hopefully. Uh, And I am looking forward to uh, Sharon's uh, book launch at the Center for Jewish History. It will be our honor and great pleasure. Uh, I just want to say that this is not the end of uh, family affairs. We still have um, at least one more episode and the grand finale, uh, at least for this academic year. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, I also want to know to let you know that uh, we're going to have a book talk uh, by Eliana Adler, uh, Adlers, which is going to be about Jewish-Polish refugees uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, it is an important book. It was... The topic was mentioned tonight, uh, so I think that you are um, 
all going to uh, to enjoy this uh, this book talk. It will happen on March third uh, at the Center for Jewish History virtual space. So please stay tuned. Uh, thank you very 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 much for tonight. Uh, it was it was an uh, as always a fascinating uh, conversation that I hope is going to continue. Um, and um, let's see each other during our next meeting next next month. Uh, Natalia, am I right? April, April seventh. Exactly. Uh, and if you um, would like to support Center for Jewish History, please do so, so that we can do even more um, episodes of the series next academic year, uh, please donate. Uh, you can do this through our website uh, and you will be able to do it uh, on, in the, with a button uh, in the email that uh, we're going to send you with the link to the recording of tonight's program. Uh, thank you again. And let's all see each other again very soon. <laughs>